All right, so today's video is going to be a Q&A, basically going over a few really good questions that I've gotten throughout my videos that I've made on this channel uh, that I thought would be a little bit better suited in video form rather than me just replying to a comment. So that's not to say that I won't make separate videos diving a little bit deeper into these topics, but to respond to these questions the best that I could, I think a Q&A video like this is probably best, and I would definitely be willing to do this maybe once a month or once every few weeks, basically. Every time I get 10 or 15 really good questions, I'll put them in video form and give a little bit more of an in-depth answer. I'm not going to go too uh, crazy and make this like a two-hour video or anything, but I do want to give uh, the best answer that I can in a compact amount of time. So before we get into it, um, I did finally find a power rack that actually would fit in my basement. As you can tell, um, I've been sitting on an Olympic bench basically for every video that I've had. Uh, I ended up selling that on Facebook Marketplace today. It sold in like 30 minutes. It was really easy. I've had this squat stand over here too. So I, if I ever do like a barbell movement, like a bench or a squat or something, I have this like kind of crappy pain in the ass squat stand, like half rack type of deal. And then I had this Olympic bench that I was sitting on as well. Obviously this isn't it. I already sold the Olympic bench, but my plan is to sell those too and replace it with this basically shorter power rack that will actually fit in my low ceilings down here. I just found out that Titan Fitness has one that's like six feet and change. So it's not, it's not going to be like one of these eight foot or seven foot racks that barely fits in here where I can't even use the pull-up bar on it properly. So very excited about that. But besides the point, um, let's get into the Q&A. So first question I've got here is from Andre Late Da Silva. I probably pronounced that wrong, so I apologize if I did. If you want to leave a pronunciation in the comments, I would appreciate it. So I'm just going to call you Andre for now. So he says, will you make a video talking about proximity to failure and how close you should train to it? So yes, I will have a video on that 100%. A brief answer on this would be proximity to failure really does depend on where you're at in your training age and it depends on the lift. So if you're doing a cable bicep curl, that's a lot different than a barbell squat. Those are two very different lifts. What I generally recommend is you always wanna be within zero to maybe three or four reps from failure. Most lifts are gonna fall somewhere in that about one, maybe two, or even zero uh, reps from failure. Certain lifts, like maybe a deadlift variation of some sort or a squat variation of some sort it's not a terrible idea to leave three or sometimes four but that's generally if you're getting to a lift where you don't want to train close to failure it's probably not the best for hypertrophy anyways so the way that you should be thinking about this is the more joints and the more muscles involved in the movement and the bigger the muscles involved are the farther you want to be generally from failure unless it's a machine so if you're doing like a free weight compound lower body movement that is probably something that is generally going to be further from failure than um anything that's either smaller muscles fewer muscles or fewer joints involved and generally an upper body movement so that let's say a bicep curl where it's on a cable that's a very small muscle involved there's no need for stabilization since the cable's already set in its place. Um, that you can take much closer to failure and there's no, there's really no risk to that. And you'd actually, I'd actually argue that a conventional deadlift for six reps, four reps from failure is going to be more fatiguing than a cable bicep curl taken to failure. Uh, next video, next video, what am I talking about? I'm tired. Uh, next question. Also from the same guy, Andre, he said, what do you think about GPP work to improve work capacity, build muscle and be fitter? GPP work is something that will build muscle indirectly. So there's a lot of things that do build muscle indirectly, AKA allow you to train a little bit harder and get a little bit more work in. So GPP work is great. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but there's a lot of ways you can be generally physically prepared. Um, what I'd recommend is just play some sports a couple times a week. If you're doing that consistently year round, that's going to be a really good way to be generally physically prepared. Um, 
that's probably the best the best thing to do but um let's see playing sports and getting your cardio in will 100% improve your work capacity because let's say let's say you're doing a leg day it's very common for new lifters to be tired basically from their cardiovascular and their respiratory system before their legs actually get tired out so if you can increase your work capacity in a cardiovascular and respiratory sense then you can actually get more volume in over time and not be uh, you don't want that stuff to be a limiting factor in your actual hypertrophy training, if that makes sense. So GPP work, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I would recommend, I think for most people, it's very practical just to play some sports. Obviously, there's more specific GPP work you can do in the gym. It won't directly build muscle, but it will allow you to train harder. And it's this is really good just for long term uh, overall health and fitness. And at the same time, yeah, you'll be able to get in a little bit more work to build some muscle. Next question we got here is from green W B I F Y. Not sure what that means, but got a couple good questions here. So he said, if you accept doing the same weight and reps for several sessions, how long should you be satisfied doing the same thing before you potentially switch exercises? For example, say I do a three by 10 lat pull down. I do the same weight and reps for four weeks in a row. Should I keep doing it hoping it will improve or should I switch exercises? So the biggest question here is going to be what else in your training are you tracking? So let's take that lat pull down, for example. So how many, how many different lifts for your back are included in your training program? Are you doing just lat pull downs? Are you doing lat pull downs and maybe like a one arm row and how is the progression on the rest of them going? Like if everything in your back training is just, and there's no hard number here, but let's say you go like eight weeks and all, let's say you're doing four lifts and one of them's lat pull downs. If you haven't progressed on anything in eight weeks, there's probably something wrong with your training. In lat pull downs, I don't know if I would just get rid of them. What I would probably do is, I guess, try to maybe rotate one of your lifts that's not, a big one like a lat pull down. So let's see, there's a couple options you could do here. You could change your grip on a lat pull down if you're really not progressing. You could rotate one of your other lifts that's not a primary in your training. So like, let's say, let's say for my back workouts, my biggest movements are going to be my cable rows and they're going to be my lat pull downs. If they're starting to stall, I would probably change one of the other lifts that I do. Uh, in basically when I get a new stimulus and get a little bit stronger there, that will allow me to do more weight and basically keep progressing on the lat pull down because that movement's building muscle on a different part of my back and that will help me out a little bit. So I probably, I wouldn't worry too much about rotating lifts. I mean, the, the problem with rotating lifts is like, if you just keep jumping to something because you hit a plateau, like you're just going to run out of good lifts eventually. So like at the end of the day, you have to keep them on your program. So if progress is slow, just first, are you progressing elsewhere or is everything completely just stuck at, at basically where it's at? Um, you're definitely going to have to assess that and then kind of game plan from there. But what I'd say is either way, having something like a lat pull down, if you're, if you're really stalling out on one of those fundamental lifts, either tweak it a little bit, maybe with a pause or a slightly slower eccentric you can change a grip, like doing a mag grip or even an underhand or a regular neutral grip would all be really great. Um, either way, if you're stalled out on it, just try and progress on something else, really track your progression harder on a different lift uh, and keep accumulating this really good volume with a lat pull down, even if it's not progressing at the moment. That's not to say it won't pick back up when you progress on another lift. Um, either way, you're accumulating really good tonnage with uh, lat pull downs. So don't just, don't just ditch them if you go a few weeks without uh, making any progress. So, uh, same person, green W B I F Y. What is your opinion on periodization of weight and reps for bodybuilding? I feel like a lot of periodization is just to allow you to do different rep ranges and volumes to disguise the fact progress is slow. For example, if there's a point in doing two weeks, let's see, okay. If there's a point in doing two weeks of 12 reps, then 10, then eight, then six. 
and then you'd repeat the cycle after eight weeks. Okay, so he's saying, so for your first week, you're doing sets of 12, same with the second week. Then the third and fourth week, you're going to do sets of 10, then eighth and six. Let's see. So then you'd repeat the cycle after eight weeks, maybe only increasing the weight by 10 pounds. This allowed you to hit PR several times in different rep ranges, or should you just do sets of 10 the entire time, maybe increasing the weight five pounds after week four, then another five after week eight. So uh, my first thoughts on this are that probably would work for hypertrophy if you're incorporating the fundamentals of what you need to grow muscle in the first place. I don't think it's optimal. And the biggest thing that I want to say about this is the little like PRs you hit aren't actually like, they're not like legit PRs. So my thoughts on this is it's it's not a bad way to train. It's actually a fun way to train for a lot of people, especially if you need uh, more change in it in your training. Like it's not a bad way to stay motivated and keep kind of seeing new stuff every couple weeks because I do think it would work. The problem that I see with this type of training is it's really difficult to actually track progress because you're switching rep ranges every two weeks. So if every eight weeks you're repeating the same rep range, that is difficult. And that's just a really long time. I mean, you're only doing the same rep range, what, six times a year. Like that's just um, not optimal in my opinion. So another problem I see with this, um, and it's not necessarily a problem, but we just have to um, make sure we don't interpret this the wrong way, is the PRs that you're talking about here. And I do see that you put it in some quotations, so I do I do know you're not taking this like a literal PR, is that you will, you will hit novelty PRs. Like if you rotate lifts and you try like an underhand lat pulldown for the first time, like technically that's a PR because you've never done it before. That's the same thing with this pro program. Like you're not actually, it's not like you did um, 150 on the lap pull down for 10 reps and then came back the next week and did it for 11. Like that's a progression, that's a PR. But if I did a set of 15 on lap pull downs with 100 pounds and then did 200 for four the next week and said, oh, I went heavier and got some reps, that's a PR. It's like, no, that's equal strength. It's just adding some weight and chopping off some reps. So it's not it's not as much a PR as it is just like a lateral move. Like you're taking the weight you're adding and you're taking away from the reps. You know what I mean? So um, kind of kind of confusing. I know this one's difficult to explain, but basically you're taking, you're going to be either taking away reps to add to the weight or taking away weight to add to the reps. And that's kind of what this program seems to me. So that's why this would be a little bit difficult. Um, Next question. So Kenton Bryan weight training asks, why not order some half pound plates? We'll do at some point. Um, just have to find, just have to find the right ones and, and really do some math in my head to see what I'd need for progressions. Um, let's see next one. Andre again, he said, in your view, should isolation exercises take precedence over compound exercises or should they just be treated with equal importance? They should be 100% treated with equal importance. And compound and isolation exercises are not, they are equal, but they're not the same. So there are certain compound movements that will build muscle really well, but it only works for certain muscle groups. And then there's isolation movements that work really well for certain muscle groups, but maybe not quite as well for um, other muscle groups. So they are equal. They're kind of like apples and oranges. So um, what I'd say here is treat them equally. I know this is kind of a recurring theme on my channel, so I'm not going to go too in depth. I've talked about this before in a few videos, but they are definitely, they are definitely equal, but they are not the same. Uh, and then he has another question here, and this one's from my beginner program video. How close to failure do you think a lifter should be training and what RPE would you recommend? So I don't, let's see, I would assume he's talking about how close beginners should be training to failure. So I, this one's tough to say because I don't think beginners actually know how close they're going to failure. So I really wouldn't recommend saying like, 
focus on two reps in reserve because they're they're probably just going to short change short change themselves and really stop like two reps before it like starts to hurt or something so there's going to be so many variables when it comes to beginners like every everything every exercise every lift you do is going to be different and each muscle will like everything i mean let's take let's take squats for example that that one's going to be the easiest one to underestimate because your legs are going to burn you're going to be basically out of breath your heart's going to be racing you're just going to be tired it's like a full body movement versus let's say like a tricep push down like your triceps don't really burn um you can pretty much take those to failure and then maybe think you're not quite at failure yet because it doesn't like you don't really feel it that much and you're not that tired from it so i don't have a recommendation on an actual hard number on rpe what i would say is train it until the reps either significantly slow down or until your technique really starts to break down so that's the best piece of advice that i have there um there's too many variables from lift to lift for me to make a hard recommendation. It would have to be like an actual thought out program and I would have to see what lift are you doing? What program are you doing? So next question is from freshly smiley face also on the beginner program video, where would you implement abs and calves training in this beginner routine? I would probably add the calves to basically whichever day is easier for you it wouldn't be a bad idea just to superset it with like tricep push downs or something at the end of that first push day and you could do that i'd say probably twice a week would be totally fine um ab training you don't necessarily need direct ab work as a beginner you'll get a lot of it from your other lifts but what i would say is if you are serious about it and i I'm 100% cool with that. If you are serious about building the muscle in your core, what I would say is just do some sit-ups, do some leg raises, take them close to failure, just treat it like any other lift. Um, I'd say you could also superset those towards the end of uh, either one of those days. That should be good. Doing that twice a week should be all right. So if you feel like you have the work capacity and you want to add that in, absolutely go for it. Um, Thomas Christensen asks also on the beginner program video, how you structure it? If you only had access to a home gym with a barbell and lat pull down, do I need to change exercises each workout? So this is going to be really difficult for me to completely modify the program. But what I would say is it's not going to be the end of the world if you swap some of those dumbbell movements to a barbell movement or if you swap pull ups to a lat pull down if you don't have a pull up bar. So you're just going to have to really think logically here, like pick a variation of a certain lift. You just have to think like, okay, let's say, let's say we're doing a dumbbell bench. What's something, what's another movement that mimics this? You can do maybe a pull up or a barbell bench. You really just have to kind of think, uh, think critically on this one and figure out what are good variations because that's pretty much what you're going to have to do. Um, what I would recommend, and I know, I don't know if you plan on doing this or not, but you can actually buy Olympic dumbbells. You can get a set on Titan Fitness and basically, um, I think they're, what are they? A hundred bucks. I have, I have a couple right here. They're these like Titan Fitness Olympic dumbbells. They're 20 inches. Um, I think they're like seven and a half inch sleeves or something. They are super high quality. It's a hundred bucks for a pair. And then you can basically just load up on like five or 10 pound plates. Um, and you can use the same plates that you have for your barbell already. So getting those will give you so much variation in your training. Probably my, uh, one of my best purchases for sure. Um, next question I got would be Kempton Bryan on the beginner program video. He says no back squat or conventional deadlift seems suspicious to me. So this is kind of a one of the main points of my channel is that just because it's a basic and kind of like universal lift doesn't mean that it's necessary. There's so many different ways to do these movement patterns that I actually um I actually I can't pick one that's best for anybody. If I mean if I had to, I'd pick what I have in the program. So barbell Romanian deadlifts and then goblet squats. These are easily going to be the best for beginners. 
and this is totally subjective, this is totally just my opinion, but the reason why I prefer goblet squats over a barbell back squat for beginners is because most beginners that I've trained have a hard time actually bending their knees. They really just do a good morning when they have a barbell on their back. It's all hips, their knees don't go forwards at all, and when you have a goblet squat like this, and the dumbbells in front of you and you're holding it goblet style, it forces you to keep your chest up, squat down with your knees and hips, keep your chest high, and explode up and work your quads. Romania deadlift, I think it's a better skill for beginners to learn how to actually use um, a proper hip hinge and activate their hamstrings and glutes at the same time, while simultaneously allowing them to uh, use a little bit less weight. So that's the reason why I have those on there. Nothing wrong with a back squat or a conventional deadlift, but like they're not they're not the best. They're they're just lifts. Like we just we need to end that dogma, uh, in my opinion. So next question I got is from uh, Daki Toto. Very interesting video, as all your other ones. I find I like the way you film and talk in the videos. I find it really easy and enjoyable to watch the whole thing. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, learning to speak when I'm not speaking to somebody else and I'm literally just looking at my iPhone is very difficult. I find that it's much easier to obviously just have a normal conversation with a person, um, but it is very easy to either like lose my train of thought or not know where to go or forget where I was going in a certain sentence. So I really do appreciate that and that's a, definitely a skill that I think I'll get better at over time, but yeah, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. So he says, I can't say I have enough knowledge on this topic and I might just be an outlier, but gaining a massive weighted chin up total above 300 pounds didn't really grow my body to the extent that I have seen other people that can lift just as much as me or even less than me by quite large margins. I know strength means more. I know Okay, so what he's trying to say is, I know more strength means more muscle in a sense, but I can't help but wonder why. If it has all to do with genetics, or if it has to do with my skill in the movement, Max Ever was dead hanging chin-ups with 100 pounds around my waist for 7 full reps, yet my arms are 15 inches at 190 pounds body weight, 15 to 20% body fat at 6 foot 1, which is skinny in my opinion, like how much more weight do I have to add around my waist in a weighted chin up to get bigger from here. What is the threshold now? So uh, that is a big question and I will have a full video on this. I, I'm gonna give you a brief answer for now, but here's the harsh truth guys. You can get really strong at a lift and not get bigger from it. There's a couple of reasons why. You can do super low reps on something and just continually get stronger on it. This is how power lifters train most of the time. You do singles, doubles, triples, even sets of four or five aren't going to be optimal for hypertrophy. That's why a lot of power lifters that generally tend to train heavy can be really strong and not really be that big. Like we've all seen those guys on, I mean, they're everywhere. The power lifters that barely look like they lift that squat 700 and bench 405. Guys, it's, I mean, it, it really is possible. And if you just have like, really good leverages and you're really maximizing that lift um mechanically like you can completely avoid getting big and just get really strong on that lift i mean it, it's just the way it is and i i really hate when people say like oh you just need to get stronger to get bigger like no you need to get bigger to get stronger so if you build your lats up a ton and you build your biceps up a ton and get really big over time you'll eventually be able to do that 300 pound weighted chin up for seven reps but if you get that 300 pound weighted chin up in a way that isn't actually building you muscle in the meantime you can get that strength without getting any bigger obviously you'll get a little bit bigger don't take that literally but you can pretty much get super strong on something without getting bigger but not necessarily the other way around. This is a concept that is completely misunderstood, and I don't think the people on this platform do the best job of um, explaining that. So that is a very big point that, I mean, like that affected you. I mean, you put, it sounds like you put your heart and soul into this and you got nothing out of it. Like, I mean, obviously you got that really impressive weighted chin up, but 
that's just a, it's a classic example of somebody taking a, a point that wasn't articulated properly or maybe not understood properly and just not, I don't want to say wasting time, but I mean, let's face it, it didn't work for you. So what I'd say is isolate your arms. You have to do bicep curls and you have to find what variation is best for you. Uh, get a really good weighted stretch on your biceps, maybe do some uh, incline dumbbell curls, even some like incline cable curls with your arms behind you. I'd say do some type of spider curl where you can get a really good contraction as well and just track your isolation lifts for your biceps. Clearly, they're not going to grow from your compound lifts. Um, and I guess the only other thing I'd want to say here would be um, maybe the weighted chin-up just isn't the best for you. Like I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat where no compound movement will actually grow my arms. Like I'm just, I'm so glad I was able to think critically enough and I didn't just listen to everybody telling me to do close grip bench dips and weighted chin-ups to grow my arms. Like it's just, <laughs> it's not good advice. And I think we're getting past that at this point, but yeah, it's, you got to isolate your arms, guys. Come on. So next question we got here is from Mohammed Nofel. Uh, this is going to be from my using versus abusing progressive overload video. He says, I understand the video's concept and I can relate to it. Even though I'm only nine months into lifting, I was just wondering if, for example, one session I did curls for 40 reps, then the next session I was only able to do 37, say because I had poor sleep, diet, and hydration, but sometimes it just happens the third session, should I increase on 37 reps or on 40? So like, should I increase based on the previous session or the peak session before it? So let me see. What I'd say for you is don't focus on numbers that you've hit in the past during that specific training session. The reason why we want to track these numbers is basically just to do like a little bit of a line graph just every now and then over time. Like if you're if you're constantly trying to one up and constantly trying to like get more and more reps, you're eventually just going to lose your technique and you're going to start cheating to try and beat those PRs. And that's why I'm kind of against strength training for hypertrophy. But if you can do this for a year, let's say, let's say your, your four fundamentals and all of your fundamentals for hypertrophy training are in check and you're actually getting bigger and training properly, you will get stronger over time. So what I'd recommend for you is look back at the past six months. Are you generally on a slight uptrend on these movements? Don't worry about the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month. This stuff is not that important. Just focus on the long-term. That's why we track these lifts. So, yeah, I guess what I'd say is don't you don't have to increase or change weight or change reps or anything you're literally just going to do as many as you can across um across the three sets and the number is just going to be what it is like it'll go up down up down maybe you'll go way back and the number you haven't hit in a month but then you'll keep going up and guys i mean it's, it's not linear progress so don't worry about little changes like that and i mean yeah like you said sometimes sometimes you might not even you might feel great and just not do as many reps. And there's always going to be a little bit of um, variable in your actual technique. Like it's never just going to be perfectly consistent. So that's where these changes will generally come from outside of outside factors like diet, nutrition, and sleep. Um, next question is Kempton Bryan. He says, do you do strength work on isolation exercises? Uh, yes, I do. So uh, when you say strength work, if you're talking about like heavy strength work, like one, two, three, fours, and fives, um, generally not, but I do train to obviously get bigger, but I do track my strength progressions. So like, yes and no, it depends what you mean by strength work. Um, in my book, I don't know if I'd call it strength work, but I do actually take those isolation lifts seriously and I do track them and I do track my strength on these. Uh, so last question here is from John. This is the problem with the big three video. Basically my first video is a great video. I don't agree with you on everything, but I get your standpoint. Do you just bias movements with a better stimulus to fatigue ratio you, uh, because you feel your strength based with the big three and overhead press, I guess is, uh, big enough. Um, so thank you. And yes, so 
I do bias movements with a better stimulus to fatigue ratio, but I don't do it because I think my strength base on the big three and the overhead press is big enough. So the big three, um, you, you don't have to do those. You just have to find, it is, you do have to train all your muscles and I would recommend doing a compound movement for every muscle, but it definitely doesn't have to be the big three. If you've built up, um, basically if you've progressed a lot and you've really made a ton of strength progress on a, basically at least a lift for every muscle group, then that should be good. It doesn't have to be the big three, but uh, I think the main point of this question was to talk about biasing the movements with the better stimulus to fatigue ratio. And yes, I definitely do that. I think that is just one of the most important things you can do. Like if you can get the same results with a ton of fatigue and the same results with basically no fatigue, why would you do the one with more fatigue? It doesn't make any sense if you're training for hypertrophy. Like there are so many people out here that are just like, oh, why don't you why don't you just just do barbells just get trained for strength like quit quit being soft it's like what do you you get nothing out of it so like so many people just succumb to that and they're like oh yeah i'll just i guess yeah i gotta do it squat bench and deadlift and get bigger but okay well you could also do a hack squat and get your legs just as big if not bigger because over time you won't accumulate as much fatigue and i'd say a hack squats arguably better for your quads in the first place so you guys just have to train what feels good for you you don't want to be training overly fatigued um that will either force you to deload or weaken your training long term or even short and midterm so that's pretty much pretty much what i'd say there um yeah get the most stimulus you can, get the least fatigue you can. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I've got for today. So if you have any other questions, definitely leave them in the comments and I will answer them in my next Q&A. But yeah, with that being said, thanks for watching.